This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, my name is Gordon Smith. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist and chair of the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I am excited to have the opportunity to talk today with Suma Babu. Suma is an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and MGH. She's a physician investigator interested in ALS. She's specifically interested in, in SOD1 related ALS, hereditary ALS, which we're going to talk about today. Dr. Babu is going to talk with us about the recent FDA approval of Tofersen for ALS in, in the setting of an SOD1 mutation. So this is a, a super exciting topic. Suma, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Let's cut to the chase, right? This is super exciting. So what is Tofersen? The brand name is Calsati. But in any case, what, why is it such a big deal in the ALS community? And, and how is this going to change your practice? This is a very, very timely and important question. And Calsati is the first antisense oligonucleotide or gene-targeted therapy that has been FDA approved for a certain subtype of ALS caused by a genetic mutation due to SOD1 mutation. And this is very, very exciting for all of the ALS community. SOD1 mutation itself contributes to about 2% of all cases of ALS. And there are some subtypes of SOD1 ALS that are extremely aggressive. And this is autosomal dominant inherited gain of function mutation. And there are I've care for several families where family members have passed away within 10 to 12 months from symptom onset consistently, generations after generations. And with the approval of this gene targeted therapy, there is so much joy in the community and hope for a potentially life saving therapy for these families. And secondly, beyond SOD1 ALS, I think to first in our COSADI really brings hope and is paving the way for other forms of ALS that could also benefit from other similar gene targeted therapy approach. And in fact, there is also an antisense oligonucleotide trial in phase one that has already started for all forms of ALS or sporadic ALS outside of US and we're waiting to start that in the US as well. Before we get into you know what Tofersen is and the evidence, I, I wonder if you could just personalize this for our listeners. You know, I've been doing neuromuscular medicine for longer than I care to admit, and there's been at uh, times a sense of I don't know, nihilism. What's different this time? Why is why is Tofersen different from other therapies we've seen? What I've seen, several of our participants in the trial, as well as the expanded access protocol that followed after the trial have complete halt in progression of their clinical disease. There are a handful of participants at our site that I've seen who their neurological examination today is exactly the same as what it was when they first entered the trial, either in 2018 or 2019. 2019 was when the phase three trial started. And so I have never seen anything this remarkable in any of my ALS patients otherwise. And these are individuals who carry a very fast progressing variant of SOD1. And these are individuals who have had family members, as I mentioned earlier, pass away within 10 to 12 months historically. And this has been a game changer for these families. And they are actually changing the history for their families. It's been a very, very rewarding experience. And I think that's part of the excitement that comes with this approval. You know, sometimes we go beyond the statistical significance and p-values that we see in clinical trials. And when we see remarkable benefits in more than a handful of patients firsthand, I think it brings so much hope and promise for ALS community. Well, that's super exciting. Uh, You know, there's been a history of getting excited about small numbers of patients who have stabilization. And in fact, your group has published on this in large trial data sets. But this certainly sounds like a very different experience than what has been seen in earlier clinical trials. So that's very exciting. Maybe before we get into clinical trial uh, and the FDA approval, can you tell us just briefly how this agent works? 
tofersin or COSADI is an antisense oligonucleotide that is specific for SOD1 type of ALS individuals. And what this ASO does is it binds to the toxic mRNAs and it then allows for these toxic mRNAs to be degraded via the RNA's age pathway and cleaves the toxic mRNAs and prevents the synthesis of the toxic SOD1 protein. The toxic SOD1 protein is the hallmark and it's really at the core of what causes the problem in SOD1 ALS. And by preventing it at its grassroots level, so to speak, we're actually modifying the disease biology and rescuing motor neurons and reducing neurodegeneration. SOD1 is a vital gene for cellular function. So the aim here is not to knock out the SOD1 gene completely, but actually it is to reduce the production of the toxic form of SOD1 protein only. And that's what Colsadi does. So let's, uh, let's pivot and talk about the FDA approval, which took the accelerated approval pathway, uh, which allowed Biogen to get approval based on a surrogate endpoint measure, and in this case, the neurofilament and light chain levels. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about neurofilament light chain, because that's a hot topic across all of neurology, across all neurodegeneration, and central and peripheral nervous system, but really important here. What's the evidence that neurofilament light chain is a good predictive marker of clinical response in ALS? This is an evolving topic, and I think as a community, we're all learning still about how to use neurofilament levels in various different domains of clinical practice as well as research. And our understanding is deepening with every new study that is being published about this, and the utility is also evolving. Now, to put things in perspective, tofersin trial in the VALOR trial, the VALOR study was a phase three trial of tofersin that actually was then submitted to the FDA for approval. It was a 28-week double-blind study. And following the double-blind study, there has been an open-label extension that has been continuing indefinitely. So the predetermined outcomes in the 28-week trial included a pre-specified neurofilament light chain level as a marker of neurodegeneration. And this trial showed that in people who were treated with tofersin in the trial experienced a 55% reduction in plasma neurofilament light chains compared to the placebo group where a 12% increase was noted over that 28-week period. And this was a very nominal p-value of less than 0.0001. And that was then submitted to the FDA under the accelerated approval pathway because at the 28-week mark, the trial did not meet its pre-specified primary clinical endpoint of ALS functional rating scale change. Now, there's more complexity to this, which I'll get into in a little bit, because a clinical change appeared much later, and that was not noted until the open-label extension. This is one of those drugs that actually takes a long time to show clinical benefit, and the biomarker benefit preceded the clinical benefit. But in either case, neurofilament was a marker that led to the accelerated approval. FDA has this unique provision for accelerated approval, especially for serious or life-threatening diseases, if there is a surrogate endpoint that is likely to predict clinical benefit. And and taking into account the severity, the rarity, and the prevalence of the condition, and what are the available alternative uh, therapies at the time, taking all of this into account. So the accelerated approval pathway is an option that the sponsor of Tofersen uh, decided to pursue to get this FDA approved in an expeditious manner. Now, what we know about neurofilament levels in ALS is that a neurofilament light chain is not specific for ALS alone. It is a marker of neurodegeneration. It's a protein that leaks into the interstitial fluid and then into the blood and the spinal fluid once there is a motor axon loss. And this is seen in multiple neurological conditions. But what we know in ALS is that the levels remain fairly stable once phenoconversion has occurred. 
And there is a wonderful familial ALS cohort that was followed by Michael Benatar at University of Miami for several years. And he showed in his research work very beautifully that these neurofilament levels remain at low levels, normal levels, until the point of phenoconversion. And it turns out that neurofilament levels actually rise even before clinical symptoms appear. And once the clinical symptoms appear, the level stabilizes. And depending on whether an individual's disease has a fast or slow progressing course, it may stabilize at different levels. So fast progressors tend to have much higher levels of neurofilament compared to slow progressors. And compared to other neurodegenerative diseases, there are papers that have shown that neurofilament levels actually exceed in ALS compared to nearly all other neurodegenerative diseases. So until the Tofersen trial, neurofilament level was used as a biomarker in research to determine phenoconversion in SOD1 or other asymptomatic gene carriers. But Tofersen trial is the first one that actually showed that neurofilament levels can actually be lowered by a large percentage, you know, 55% is a large percentage of decrease following treatment effect, following a disease-modifying therapy. So now the field is evolving towards whether we can use neurofilament light chain as a marker of treatment effect. And there is evolving understanding about the utility of neurofilament light chains as a prognostic marker as well in ALS, whether this could actually predict a change in clinical function even before the clinical function occurs. But one has to be careful about how we use neurofilament light because one, it is not specific for ALS. And two, there is on an individual level, some variability in terms of change over time, as well as the baseline levels for individual A versus individual B. So on a group level, on a large group level, very clear that it is a clear marker that can be used for phenoconversion. And now with the tofersin as a marker of treatment effect, but on an individual level for routine clinical practices, I think we have to be a little careful. There are recently other therapies in ALS, for example, Relivrio showed a clinical benefit, but did not actually move the neurofilament level as such. So I think this is where our understanding about neurofilament is complex and it is evolving. I think we'll need more evidence to solidify this. So it sounds like the timing and context are going to be really important, timing in terms of disease progression and understanding the importance of NFL levels and their change. Can you tell us more about the open label extension? The New England Journal article didn't show a very impressive clinical outcome, but you mentioned that data coming out of the open label extension study suggested a more significant treatment effect. Can you tell us about that? The most recent data was presented at the March 2023 FDA Advisory Committee meeting, and all of that is available on the FDA website as well. So just to take a step back and talk about the open label extension design itself. Open label extension trial is for trial completers who have completed the 28 weeks of the double blind portion. And these are participants who continued on from both the phase one multiple ascending dose trial, as well as from the phase three Valor trial. And this is a trial that has been ongoing almost indefinitely since 2017 when the first open label extension was initiated. And um, in the uh, Valor trial particularly, there were a total of 95 participants who entered the open label extension. And out of these 95 participants, 63 participants, that is 88%, actually received Tofersen during the initial double blind portion. And 32 participants received placebo. So the folks who actually received Tofersen initially were called as the early start group. And folks who rolled over from the placebo group into the open label extension were called as the delayed start group. And what we know is that at the 52-week mark, and this is using the more recent data cut that was presented at the FDA ADCOM uh, just before the approval, the primary endpoint was the ALS FRSR or ALS functional rating scale change. And there were clear separation between the two groups in the early treated versus the delayed start group at that week 52 mark. And there, there was a value of 0.02 that was achieved uh, with a difference of about 3.5 point change over that 52 week mark in ALS functional rating scale. 
Now, in addition to the ALS functional rating scale itself, there were multiple secondary endpoints that favored early stratoferson over the delayed stratoferson in the open label extension. For example, the respiratory function, which was measured using predicted slow vital capacity, also favored a slower decline in early stratoferson group at that week 58 and showed a statistically significant difference of P of 0.01 at that week 52. Secondly, including the quantitative muscle strength testing using handheld dynamometry that also showed a statistically significant group difference in early start versus delayed start group at that week 52 mark with a p-value of 0.01. So what about patients with sporadic ALS? I think there are probably, what, three, 400 patients in the country who have an SRD1 mutation in ALS, but many, many more who have sporadic ALS. You must be getting a ton of questions from your sporadic ALS patients about the uh, Tofersen approval. What are you telling them about this? This is one of those situations where there is a lot of joy in that very small subset of ALS patient population with SOD1, but what does it mean for the rest of the ALS community? What does it mean for 98% of the ALS community beyond SOD1? We are getting a lot of questions about this. And you know what is really exciting right now, where we are in the ALS space right now, is that there are more antisense oligonucleotide or gene-targeted treatment trials that are emerging beyond SOD1 itself. ASOs are sort of like lock and key mechanism, and it works only for a specific indication. So currently, there is combined phase 1 to 3 treatment trial for a different genetic subtype called as the FUS mutation, fusion and sarcoma mutation. This is also another very aggressive aggressive form of ALS, and this is the only form that actually can even affect adolescents. Most other forms affect adults only. So it's exciting that we're able to offer a gene-targeted treatment trial for individuals with FUS mutation. There is another one that targets ataxin-2 repeat expansion, and the one that targets ataxin-2 repeat expansion is designed in such a way that it also is open for sporadic ALS patients because of some preclinical data that suggests that Using ataxin 2 protein could have a modulating effect on TDP43, which is almost universal in ALS individuals except for the SOD1 gene mutation positive individuals. And then thirdly, there is another ASO treatment trial that has begun for sporadic ALS particularly from a company called Curalis. This is a, a molecule called QRL201. And that has uh, that treatment trial is in phase one and has already begun its first cohort enrollment in countries outside of U.S. And we're waiting for the U.S. FDA to give permission to start this trial here in the U.S. as well. And even beyond Tofersen and ASOs, there are and this is a number that keeps changing continually. And the last time I checked, there are over 160 companies that are developing therapies for ALS. Well, Suma, thanks so much for a truly remarkable podcast. What an amazing time this is in the field of ALS and neurodegenerative disease and, and neurology in general. Thank you so much. I want to thank our listeners for listening to today's podcast and a very exciting episode. For those who are interested, you can find the Tofersen Phase Three clinical trial in the New England Journal of Medicine. The first author was Tim Miller. And you can find the open label extension data, which I found particularly exciting, on the Food and Drug Administration website. And again, thanks so much for joining us on a podcast of the podcasts I've done. I found this particularly exciting because it really captures the energy and what's new in neurology and why it's such an exciting time to be caring for patients with ALS and other related disease. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute while you're exercising or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.